I like that you've touched heavily on the power of mentorship and not just that, but how to approach a mentor for mentorship and how to pre prepare yourself for opportunities. Because it's one thing to ask for mentorship, but mentorship is a two-way street. You also need to be ready and receptive for the mentorship itself and make it easy for the mentor to provide mentorship to you. And I like how you have really demonstrated that. So just to talk a bit about your work um, in the University of Copenhagen, but even before when you worked in Yale, um, what, what, what would you say are the unique advantages that being in such settings in the Western world offered with your work compared to doing such kind of research back home? Okay, so I think most research in the West is driven by curiosity. People are curious enough to want to know more about something, learn about something. And you, you, you're in the UK and you'll probably hear uh, all this, there's always this lingo that if you want to make money, get out of academia. Because academia was never meant for making money. Academia was meant for building knowledge systems, uh, developing new ideas in that setup. It's not money driven, it's knowledge driven, curiosity driven, interest driven. And uh, at Yale, at Freiburg, even here, what I see is you see true interdisciplinarity. Yeah? It's true interdisciplinarity. First, this hierarchical thing is not there. Yeah? I remember when I first moved to the UK and even when I moved to Germany, uh, I saw my uh, the head of our institute actually going to work on a bicycle. And you know, that was a culture shock. Yeah, That was a real, real, real culture shock. In Kenya, you cannot expect the director general of Cambridge to be going to work on a bicycle or uh, the guy from ECP going to work. No, it's the big SUVs and whatever, you know? And then that thing of addressing somebody as, oh, professor so-and-so or uh, doctor so-and-so, it's also not there. You just call somebody by their name. So they've, they've removed those hierarchies. So once everybody is seen as equal, then you create a, a flat environment where knowledge can, where I can learn from an undergraduate student as much as I can learn from a professor. Yeah, I can learn from a lab technician as much as I can learn from a, a PhD student and so on. So we need to break those hierarchies. I think in my country, and I'm not afraid to say this, we are so obsessed with titles. Yeah, We are so obsessed with titles. And that's why even somebody, you are a PhD holder, instead of working on your research, you go and do an MBA so that you want to become a, a vice chancellor. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, you have knowledgeable people working as high end administrative clerks because all they do is sign papers and smile to the camera. And these are people who can actually make real changes in whatever they do. If you are, if you are a trained chemist who understands organic chemistry, physical chemistry, or a particular uh, medicinal chemistry, I mean, you should be you should be in a lab somewhere mentoring people so that then uh, 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 they can come up or, or develop new ideas or you can challenge the, the, the status quo or the dogmas that we know. But hi, what are we doing? We are being driven in, in big cars, being shuffled around. Uh, and now we are signing checks. Oh, I want, we want to build, or we want to build some flower, some flower beds, or we want, it's, it's nuisance. Actually, universities can be run by HR practitioners, you know, because that's what they are, they, are, they, are, they are taught to do. Yeah, universities can be run by HR practitioners. And if you want to know why now this problem has even permeated into our institutions, you find there is a, there's a director and then there's a deputy director and then there's a head of the department. So it's just too much is power, you know? But what are we using this power for? Nothing. I mean, my institute here, uh, we are about 20 groups. So uh, uh, 20 groups, that means 20 professors. Uh, the institute is run by a strategic team. It's six people maximum, six people maximum. And only one of them is a professor at the same institute, who is the ex general executive director. The rest are just people who know what they do I'm good at communication, I'm going to be the head of communication. So they communicate all the research and everything that comes from there. 
I'm head of finance. I'm going to manage all the budgets of them. Yeah, but we, we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so if a vice chancellor has got five deputy vice chancellors and then there's a registrar and several deputy registrars, yeah? and then you go to the account departments, there's senior accountant one, a senior accountant two. I mean, I mean what, what is that? So most universities, and I know I'm coming back home next year and probably I'll be trying to look for employment in some of them, but I will still call them if they're doing something wrong. Most universities have become employment bureaus. They are no longer centers for learning, innovation, research, or even thinking. No, they are not that. And as long as, because the, the, I think the word university come, is, it comes from a, either a Greek or Latin word. It's something to do with knowledge acquisition and knowledge creation. Yeah. But if a university has got more, uh, 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 more uh, uh, non-teaching staff faculty than the teaching staff faculty, something is definitely wrong with that university. Yeah. If we have 200 accountants, for example, or 100 accountants, for example, yeah, and yet we say that, oh, we are a, we are a world class, and you know this tag, world class university. Really? No. So back to the question. We we, we have to rethink how we do how we do uh, our our research in the country. I mean, you have some very good institutions. Ildre is doing amazing. ICP is doing amazing. So we don't need to go to Singapore or to Finland to learn about how they do these things. You just need to walk into Ilri and ask them, how are you doing this? Walk into Isipe, how are you doing this? Walk into uh, 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 Kemri Welcome Trust in, uh, in, in Kilifi, how are you doing this? So you'll find it's interdisciplinarity, it's true collaboration. You're trying to solve a problem and there's, there's, there's not this thing of, you know, I want to be better than Anita or I want to be better than David. Yeah. But you, you're just in your niche. You're trying to make a difference in your niche. Yeah. And then uh, something else that is also emerging now in Europe, you see like people come together and then uh, and there are certain core facilities that they share. So if you want to, for instance, have a sequencer, I mean, there's no need for uh, 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 10 or 20 universities to all have sequences. These things can be done centrally. You know, we have a core facility that can do all these things and we all chip money into that. It's centrally managed and it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, but we, I, don't think, I don't think we are there yet. Yeah, and that is why private universities in Kenya are suddenly now coming up on top of public universities because they've realized we have to do our core mandate, which is teaching and research. Yeah. But it's not about, oh, we are fighting for this position or that position, this position and that position. And then in the end, you, you, you are learning something like biochemistry and something like, for instance, in our field, biochemistry, immunology, uh, biotechnology, it's evolving daily. So if your PI or if your lecturer is not doing research, how is he teaching you? He's probably teaching you things that happened in 1990s. We are in 20, we are almost in 2030. You know, so so yeah, so and it's up to us as young people uh, 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 to come up with uh, 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 with new ways of addressing these systemic challenges. Yeah, we, you cannot just walk into an institution and be part of the problem because then we will not solve anything. And actually, that's also informs informed why we started this Integrated Cancer Research of Kenya Foundation because you just look around and you're like, I don't really see myself fitting in any of these spaces. I want to do research. I want to help people. I want to mentor people. But I don't want to be in a situation where if I want to buy a pen, it has to, I, I, it, the check has to be signed by five people. I mean, what the hell is that? We will forever lag behind as the world advances, or we will always receive the breadcrumbs as the world advances because we are trapped in bureaucratic systems. Yeah. So we, that's something we must just get rid of. Yeah, so get rid of all that and just invest, invest in, invest in like, you know, research systems. And to finish, one thing that they also do well here is funding. Yeah, uh, whether it's rich families, rich institutions, uh, 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 public funding and so on. I mean, I always say this, can you imagine since Kenya got independence, 
there have only been two cancer calls for grant funding. One was by Uhuru Kenyatta in 2020 when we had COVID and we applied for that. We've never even received a response. The next one was in 2024, so this year. And this was by NCI Kenya. And they set out a cancer call and uh, I, I now hear they are going through the proposals and everything. So maybe we'll hear from them. I'm still crossing my fingers that at least they will respond. So, so we need we need money, and I, for one, I believe that there's money in our country. Yeah, if we can buy a bottle of water that costs 100 shillings for 800 shillings or 900 shillings, as Kwame Owino puts it, we can save that 800 shillings and direct it to research. Yeah, so so so, so we we have to start building knowledge systems that can generate wealth. We cannot keep this idea of you know supply that oh i'm supplying i'm supplying toilet paper that, that you're a millionaire from supplying toilet you don't even make toilet paper you're supplying we're never going to go anywhere so and as i finished just to tell you how much this how much important this is the amount of money that denmark a country of five million or six million people makes from just exporting biotech products this is these are medical products antibodies you know all these things that are used in a, in a in a healthcare setting and whatever it's almost four trillion kenya shillings that was last year we don't even collect that as taxes in kenya yet that only makes up about 12 percent of the economy so think about that so it means there is money or there's value in research. If you if you invest money in systems that produce knowledge, then people are gonna create things out of that. And the African frontier is our market. Yeah, if you start producing things in Kenya, Uganda is your market, Rwanda, uh, Burundi, Tanzania, DRC, yeah, and so on and so forth. So 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 we need to think that way. Yeah, but if we still want to, you know, uh, 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 we want to allocate. Uh, 1 billion shillings for the whole of research in Kenya. But then we also want to allocate 1 billion shillings uh, for prayer intercessors at a certain institution that I don't want to mention. We will continue being here. Let me finish it at that. On that very powerful note. <laughs> so um, if you're joining us, we are in conversation with Victor Oria. And if you've been following this conversation, you know how powerful it has been. So I'll give a chance for questions. If any one of us has questions, if you put them in the chat, this is your chance to ask them yourself. But if you want to, I can also read them out. So, okay, um, just raise your hands. I can see Stephen. Was that a hand? Okay, unmute and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you, Victor, for such an elaborate uh, talk and uh, uh, I'm so grateful to be part of it at this moment. I like the way you hit it, or you hit the nail on the head without uh, having to look aside. However, we were discussing with a friend and saying sometimes the more things change, the more they remain the same. So I don't know as scientists, will we start focusing on now changing the system and now coming back to research later? Uh, but uh, I'm glad now that we can now start seeing it and open our eyes, we'll be able to do more. One thing maybe I would uh, like to get from you, uh, I just noted you, you could easily point out uh, some of these research opportunities. Just the way you've mentioned the MEG, uh, the MEG uh, scholarship, I think, in Freiburg. Uh, I don't know how maybe you could be able to reach out to, uh, maybe after getting these opportunities, how can they trickle down to us? We may not be having you uh, every weekly on the MSJ, which I'm uh, I'm happy for Anita and uh, Ruth, what they're doing. But I don't know how you could do it. I'm not so sure if, I just followed you on your X handle. So maybe mm -hmm. I don't know how you could trickle down to most of us out of this place. We may not have your WhatsApp contact to keep on following up, but maybe you can have a channel for that. And also, uh, just keeping what you're doing, uh, the way you've just said it, how we, maybe you can follow it uh, on SpaceX or some other platform, but it's good uh, for us to maybe know how we can get it from you. Sorry if I took more time, Anita. Thank you. Mm, yeah, actually, Stephen, uh, 
before we before you guys joined anita and i were talking about this and we were like in kenya there's a lot of science happening but we never hear about it so we must just build communication and platforms like msj are, are a good start yeah i mean uh, 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 when I when I when I was at university, I was a member of the Biochemical Society of Kenya. They don't even have an address. Yeah, you you if, if you Google them, you'd find them on some some weird Facebook, and you're like, who runs this thing? But then suddenly you you you, you read a professor's CV. Oh, I'm a member of the Biochemical Society of Kenya. You know, so that's why now there is this uh, there's a new organization that came up called the Biochemistry and Biotechnology Professional Society of Kenya. The new one at least now it's, people are like just tired of the other one and they decided we're gonna do a new one and i think that is what we need to do because change is inevitable if 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 if, if uh, our, our big uh, national uh, centers don't want to evolve then we have to create our own systems outside of those ones and operate outside of those ones uh, uh so regarding these opportunities that you're talking about yeah i mean sometimes i share them by email or on the bbsk platform or sometimes just on on, on twitter and, uh, and uh, or if somebody asks there are people who ask you that or oh, if you come across an opportunity like this please just share it with me so i always do that so i mean if you follow me on linkedin or whatever and you're interested yeah just tell me and i will i will i will i will try to share whatever uh, whatever opportunities I uh, uh, I come across. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. So I'm going to read a question. Oh, OK, Freddy, go ahead. I almost read your question on your behalf. Please unmute. You will read the question later. Now I, I ask a completely different one. <laughs> OK, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, Victor mentioned something about uh, you call it, uh, medical diagnostics, and I happen it happens to be the area that I work in. So mm -hmm. did you follow that through, or you now moved to research? And if you moved to research, then how does that then translate to to patient care? Because like uh, the the best outcomes for the patient, and I'm um, saying this from like I've been in your area of research, which is uh, cancer genomics, mm -hmm. and now I'm in human genetics. I think my my field and Ruth's field they they they, they are the same HLA and all that in transplantation and care. So, is how does your research uh, now? go to the translation because yeah most of the research has to lead somewhere yes uh thanks uh freddie and freddie is a very good friend of mine actually you know uh he was one I of hope, the people who i hope you didn't put him people. in the audience to ask a question no 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 no, <laughs> no I'm, I'm, the, the I'm the one who told the i'm the one who told ruth to invite uh victor actually yeah. ah great great yeah okay he's one of my good friends so yes uh so, like I said, Freddie, when I did uh, uh, that MSc in medical diagnostics, my interest was to go back and uh, work for the uh, suppliers in Kenya. But I needed to have an understanding of uh, like how do these things work, because you know you remember like you remember that uh, that shock you had when you were learning about uh, a qPCR in class, and then. You go to Camry and you're wanting you you asking yourself where is this big QPCR machine, and then you find it's a small thing like this, yeah. So that was the shock. So I was like, if I really need to be in this field, I really need to go and understand like how do these things look like. Uh, so unfortunately, it's something I'm still interested in, but I'm not working on that. Uh, I I got interested in translational research. But now I've even come back down. I want to come back down to basic research. That's actually what I want to do. I just want to exploit new knowledge because translational research is full of ups and, ups and downs. And those of you in the medical field know this. Uh, clinical trials fail every day. And uh, I think there's too many uh, uh, bad news in the world. I'm not interested in more in more of these uh, uh, failings. I want to go back to really, 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 really basic research, like unearthing new uh, 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 
Uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the whole point was, uh, sorry, uh, like, because you, you, in, if you put it in the perspective of like uh, diagnostics, so mm -hmm. you, you could just say it's basic research, but then it's helping to identify something like uh, now I will let uh, Anita read the question in the in the chat, then you link it up, then maybe we can get somewhere. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So the question is, um, so the, the background is that many types of genomic anomalies can cause or indicate disease. And as a result, researchers traditionally relied on multiple techniques to identify and analyze different forms of cancer. Um, TGS can now generate ultra long reads and real time results, for example, nanopore, which can also detect epigenetic modification. So, how do you apply these texts for the characterization of cancer samples? So, link that to the previous one as well. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, that's a tough question. Uh, so, first, uh, even though I'm in the field, uh, I don't apply most of these technologies. I mean, there are things I don't I, I don't use them daily. Yeah. So you you need to use them if you want to answer a particular question and uh, and, and whatever. So um, yeah, cancer is evolving, and the more we uh, uh, the more we understand it, the more complex it becomes. The more we realize there are more hidden mutations. There are all these epi, 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 uh, now we have this new field that has just grown epi, of epigenetics and the epigenome. We are still trying to understand that and of course industry is building all these new tools to help and add and add this and uh it's imp uh, and <clears throat> there was a recent paper that was published by a, a kenyan uh, a kenyan scientist called francis makoa he's probably here where they were looking at probably uh, uh, uh the diversity of uh, uh triple negative breast cancer in kenyan women african-american women and caucasian women and they they found that they're different mutation hotspots for Kenyan women that differs from African-American women that again differs from the European or the Caucasian, Caucasian women. And all this, all this is because of uh, these tools that, uh, 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 that uh, Freddie is talking about, because it's helping to, uh, 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 to you, you're doing this deep characterization of cancers to understand it at a very personal level. Because even in Kenya, I'm sure, if you look at a, a, a breast cancer, say from women in Taita Tavet and probably women in Turkana, you, you, you'll find differences. So all these tools are important. And later, they inform diagnosis, they inform the kind of treatment that, uh, uh, that you know that you're going to have. Yeah, so I, 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 I agree with, I agree with uh, uh, everything that he's saying, uh, even though personally, that's not really what I, that's not really what I do. Yeah, but I still have an understanding of what they of what they are trying to accomplish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have another question. I'm going to summarize it, though you've attached on it a bit. Just feel free to not repeat what you've said earlier. They're asking um, how smooth or hard is it for someone, let's say in Tanzania, to transition from a PhD or postdoc into academia? But my understanding is that the PhD or postdoc is already a transition into academia, but you can talk more about that. To transition into academia in Europe, they are interested in the epigenetics of colorectal cancer. Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy, I would say, because academia is very competitive, I would say. It's really not, not what I would say. It's really, really, really competitive. Actually, there's a there's a, a very depressing picture of a funnel where you're like a hundred percent and then it drains down and the only people who actually make it as group leaders or pis is less than 10 percent yeah so rather than coming to europe i would say why don't you build systems there in tanzania and find people who are doing similar things in europe and try to collaborate with them yeah yeah because even though I'm here right now in Copenhagen, uh, 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 I would like to do this in my country because I think I'll be more useful in Kenya. Here, I'm just another fish in the sea. In Kenya, I'll probably be breaking new ground, you know? Yeah? 
I, I, I'll probably breaking new ground. But it's, I don't know if it has happened, but you, you have to be very, 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 very top notch in your field to move from a, an academic or a PhD position or a postdoc in Kenya or Tanzania to like a group leader in a European university. It's, I think it's very difficult. It's really, 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 really difficult, but you can try, you never know, yeah? What I see, what I see mostly happening is when people do their PhDs, uh, you do it at a, maybe a medium-sized university, and then you go to maybe Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you do your postdoc there, get a big paper, and then you use that to find a group leader position at another medium-sized university. That's how I think it operates. Yeah, but uh, they're welcome to try. Uh, uh, if you don't try, you will never know. That's what I can say. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's that's very practical. So we are three minutes to the top of the hour. And before um, I look at the comments to see what other questions we have. OK, there's one more from Gift. Um, what is the landscape of cancer awareness in Africa? And how is the lack of this awareness playing a role in policymakers putting it more on a back seat and rather doing things that make people or voters happy now. For example, the HPV vaccine can lower cervical cancer occurrence, but you find some countries are starting to introduce it now. Um, so yeah, your comments about the awareness of cancer and how that affects political goodwill. Uh, again, I will say this. Somebody's mic is okay. I'll say yeah. this. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the landscape of cancer awareness in Africa, it's huge. There are so many organizations doing so many things. There are credible organizations whose interest is to actually inform patients and help them. But again, there are also briefcase organizations with their own interests. It happens everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but it goes back again to what we were discussing uh, or even uh, to... Uh, to the other question that somebody asked before. Communication, yeah? You see, when our president recently said that, oh, we are doing so many things, but communication is very, is very, is, is very poor. Like, for me right now, I'm saying, if you have nephews, uh, not nephews, if you have nieces, sisters, cousins, who are younger than 15 years, and you live in Africa, you need to find out how they got the HPV vaccine. Because if not, that's, there's a probability that one of them is going to be a cervical cancer patient in the future. And by the time we find it, it's probably too late to help. Yeah? Most HPVs, I mean, 95% uh, of cervical cancer is HPV driven. It's a virus. And we make vaccines for viruses. So stop listening to all these things about, oh, Bill Gates wants to cull the population, oh, Sijui, they want to know. It's, it's all nonsense, yeah? It's all nonsense. HPV vaccine has proven quite effective in a lot of countries. In fact, in a country like Scotland, they've even started giving it to, to boys, yeah? And there, there's a recent study that came out, uh, I think earlier this year, where they are looking at uh, uh, the, the prevalence of cervical cancer in women who are vaccinated, I think, 15 years ago. And they find very, 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 very low incidence rates compared to countries that have not uh, encouraged the uptake of HPV vaccine. So take this vaccine, guys. I'm not paid by uh, somebody to, uh, uh, to promote this or whatever, but the HPV vaccine works. It stops. Uh, 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 these cases of cervical cancer because you cannot police your daughters or your nephews or your nieces or your cousins sexual life you cannot police that but the one thing that you can make sure they do is they take this vaccine so even if they decide to live their life the way they want at least you know that they are protected yeah I mean, wasn't this the same narrative when we had hiv aids in kenya and people were being asked to use uh, uh, like condoms and the, in fact in my community the whole thing was oh my god no way yeah and uh, the Luo community bore the brand of this I mean a lot of our folks our grandparents died out of uh, 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 ignorance yeah so cervical cancer 
can be prevented. You cannot prevent colon cancer or 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 stomach cancer or brain. Those are ones. Those ones you cannot prevent. But we can prevent cervical cancer. Yeah. So let's take the vaccine. Let our young girls take that vaccine between ten and fourteen years. I think that's the standard age when it's supposed to be done. Yeah. That's what we should do. Yeah. And then politicians should stop talking about things they don't know. Yeah. These are things. These are things that should be led by the Ministry of Health and their technical teams. Those are the ones that should be talking to us, not a politician standing on a podium and starting to say that, oh, if you take this vaccine, utakuwa tasa. Where, where oh, you'll be infertile or this will happen. Where did they do that research to find that out? Yeah. Yeah. So these vaccines work. They've been proven. They're being used worldwide across all countries. Yeah. So it's not only happening in Kenya. It's, it's, it's happening in Scotland, in England, in Germany, in Denmark, in Norway. Yeah? So are we very special that they want to kill us? Why are they not killing their own people? Yeah, yeah. So we should stop that propaganda and just like, you know, but again, communication. That's really, really, really important. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we are three minutes past the hour, which is our time. So if you have any more questions, I would encourage um, I would encourage you to reach out to Victor on X or on LinkedIn, Victor Oria on LinkedIn. And I'm sure he'll be very, very happy to engage and answer your questions. Um, so as a parting shot, maybe you could, so we usually have an, a question we ask every scientist who comes on board on MSG, and it's the work-life balance. So one, what hobbies or activities do you have that you engage in to maintain balance, and how do you manage that with your demanding role in research? Uh, yeah, work-life balance, that's the, the, the new thing, yeah? Yeah, so... Uh, so I do things like this. I sit down with my friends and we 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 have beer and we talk about the world and whatever. Uh, I go out, uh, play football, play rugby sometimes, just with friends here. But I also spend my time watching football, watching rugby. I'm a big fan of wrestling. I know it's I'm not 12, but yes, I'm a big fan of wrestling. Every Tuesday morning and Saturday morning, I have to spend an hour, you know, Monday nights run, Friday night smackdown. You have to do that. I read, yeah, I read a lot of books. Uh, I travel. Uh, uh, recently, I was in Greece, a very, very interesting country. The food is amazing. And they say, if you travel, you get to see things that you've just always imagined. Yeah. Uh, I watch a lot of documentaries. Yeah, because that's also how uh, uh, how you learn. Uh, if I want to, like you know, just get some stories from the village and whatever, I talk to my village mates a lot, almost on a weekly basis. And I go home every year to recharge. It's always nice to sit next to your 98 year old grandmother, and just let her fill your ears with words. It's very helpful. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just the usual things that people do. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I, uh, I try to make sure. Uh, I, I try to make sure that I work between eight and four. So I try to maintain that eight hour a day shift because if you don't do that, you'll burn out and the research people burn out. And when you're burned out, then you're frustrated. Nothing works. So I try to maintain that, and then, of course, I spend time with my with my family. Uh, we do things that we enjoy together, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's how that's what I do. Thank you, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, six minutes over time. We apologize for going over time, but I think no, one I hour mean, is not enough. I still, have time. <laughs> I still have time, by the way. I set aside two hours for this. So okay, you know, okay, yeah. okay. But you I need to come back. <laughs> So, okay. Um, yeah. I think if you have time for one more question, then you can finish by telling us, um, there's a question from Bravin, how would you encourage people to be researchers in Africa? So that will be like the overall um, 
cutting short? How would you encourage people to be researchers in Africa so that we solve our own problems rather than leaving the continent in search for greener pastures in the West and then the Westerners come and solve our own problems and we have this vicious cycle where we are made to be seen like specimens rather than beneficiaries of the research. So you can conclude with that. I think it comes down to personal identity and our own personal identities inform our national identity. You know, I mean, listen to even our politicians when they are announcing something. Oh, we are doing housing because Singapore did housing. Oh, we are doing light railway because Japan did some light railway. We don't have our own national identities. Uh, politics or bad politics robbed us of that. That is why uh, uh, we very few people uh, uh, and, uh, and there are some very good institutions in Kenya that have now come up independently just doing their own stuff because they're trying to reclaim uh, that identity because without identity you cannot do anything yeah and without I mean you, you, you the Olympics just ended before Kenya won the first goal you could see all the fire and whatever on uh, on Twitter like why are we not winning gold blah blah reason because there's an attachment to it yeah and, and that's what we need we need to go back and attach ourselves to these problems so i wrote something somewhere here let me see if i can find it yes find a niche that you love or care about yeah whether it's forestry whether it's you know making the best chapati or making the best madondo find a niche that you care about yeah you go into a bookstore here, there's, there's like a very long shelf of cooking books. Those are some of the things that surprised me. I'm like, you know, we, we use books to cook. You visit people here and people have like a shelf in the kitchen with cooking books. And it, it has an audience, it has a market. There are people who cannot cook without using that book. Since hmm? you grew up knowing that cooking is just something you do, you know? You don't know that you have to add a particular amount of salt, a particular amount of pepper and blah, blah. Anyway, so what am I trying to say is somebody found a niche that they loved and they built it. So if you want to build research systems in Africa, you have to find a niche that you love and you cannot do it alone. Do it together with people. So for us or for me, I'm interested in cancer research. That's really, 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 really my interest. And uh, that is why we started this Integrated Cancer Research Foundation of Kenya, whose goal was to uh, uh, see whether we can build molecular cancer research in Kenya. Can we do something like that? And we are working on its baby steps. It's a lot of work. It's tiring, but it's a dream. It's, it's something that we really care about and we really want to work on it. So now we found ourselves together as a team uh, 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 we've organized ourselves, we think, we bounce ideas, uh, 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 we try out stuff. Last year, we had our first uh, a conference in Nairobi, Kenya. It was well attended. We had about 120 participants for the first time. That I count that as a success. It was really, 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 really interesting. We got some companies to sponsor us. That also showed that they believe in what we are doing. So that's very, very important. And then there are no there are no shortcuts that's the thing yeah there are no shortcuts you are not going to succeed in this industry if you like shortcuts it's not going to work huh? that uh, uh drug that we are using in the market right now say for treating breast cancer or treating colorectal cancer it took 20 years to get there it somebody didn't wake up and go to the forest collect mitishamba and suddenly, oh, we have no, it took 20 years. So you need a team, you need time, you need patience, and you need to learn and unlearn. Yeah. Don't take your knowledge as the gold standard. Knowledge is adaptive, it changes, it's dynamic. It, you know, and also be ready for disappointments because the way you see things is not the way the world sees things. Yeah? And sometimes you'll find yourself alone, but it's okay. Yeah. As long as you believe in what you're doing, push on, push forward into it. And then just try out new things, you know, try out new things. 
actually, if I tell you last year when we wanted to, when we did that conference, how that idea started, we wanted to do it as an online virtual thing, like what we are doing here. And then we were like, I mean, we're not gonna, after that, we'll close our computers and we forget everyone. So we just decided to be bold. Guys, let's do it for three days. Let's find a venue. So we talked, we spoke to Kenyatta University through a contact that we have there. And he agreed that, oh, we can host you guys. So now the next step was asking for money. So writing to this company, writing to that company, writing to this company, writing to that company. And I can tell you, the conference was held in December, December 6th to December 8th. But by October 6th, we still did not have any sponsor. But we still believed that we are going to do it physically. Even if it means going to pay some of it from uh, using our own money, we will do it. And then between November and December, we had so many sponsors coming in. We even had to tell some of them, now we don't even have space. Yeah, because it would mean redoing some of the posters, some of the booklets, and it was just too much. So we told them next time. So try out new things. Yeah, that's the only way you we will build uh, 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 things that work for us. Yeah, I mean going abroad is not wrong. Yeah, going abroad is not wrong. It's it's uh, you come here to learn, you pick ideas, and then when you go back home, you can uh, uh, replicate them not directly but in our context. Because not everything that works in Denmark is going to work in Kenya. Because the cultures are different, the people are different, how we do things are different. Yeah, but just organize. There is power in organization. Organize. Usisimame, don't be like a, a single tree just standing there by yourself. Organize into teams. That's the only way we, we break this frontier. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think it will be wise for us to end it on that very powerful note. I'd like to thank you, Victor, for your time and for your very powerful statements. I think this conversation has been really um, thought provoking. It makes me feel like there's much more I can do and I need to do to create change, especially back home in how we do our research, how we communicate our findings and how we create awareness around the work we do and just how the systems are being run. This was very, very, very exciting to have. And thank you for everyone who joined us. Uh, for this webinar and remember that we have this MSJ webinars every two weeks on Friday afternoons so uh, we'll definitely see you on the next MSJ webinar if you have any further questions please reach out to Victor on LinkedIn on X I'm sure he'll be very glad to engage thank you so much and have a lovely weekend everyone